But, Torsten, it is an exceptional privilege to have you on our Dream and Reality series in the history of geographic thought. <clears throat> of all the people we've met, I think you perhaps typify most what uh, I mean and what we both mean by the need for dialogue. Uh, there are many aspects of your work and thought which have not been adequately communicated in print, and uh, there are many in the world who know a lot about what you've done and what you've been but very few know much about who you are, and uh, so on. So I would like you to tell us very simply today something of your own life story and uh, your reflections on what you've learned through that journey. <coughs> well, um, I think I would like to begin with showing you a picture which I have taken myself from my home. Uh, when I went to school, I made actually a little study of my own home parish and um, uh, I included a picture of my home here, and I was also anxious to get myself on the picture to, to, to get me into the environment. You see, <coughs> this is a little countryside schoolhouse, as they frequently look like up in Småland, the wooded uh, back wood area in Sweden I come from. You see the ridges on both sides and the school house <coughs> in, the, in the little valley. Uh, uh, this is the place where I grew up and you can see that it's actually rather isolated in, uh, in the forest mm -hmm. and I think this isolation maybe in itself has some influence on my uh, situation and perhaps my personality. The fact that you enjoy being a little person somewhat apart from the whole. But what about the school environment, your father and mother, and your relation to the environment of your childhood? Yeah, let me first tell you a little bit about the environment. Uh, this um, <coughs> location of the schoolhouse is in a way an example of optimal location as um, uh, geographers like to think of it, because it's just uh, 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 optimizing distances from the two settlements which um, uh, sent the children to the school. On the one side here we had an old uh, medieval village actually. In that village they had um, uh, Iron Age and Bronze Age uh, um, uh, stones and, and so on. It's an, uh, a very, very old settlement. And on the other side, about one mile on this side, was a fairly new factory town. And these two settlements could not agree who of them were going to have the school. And so we got an optimal and rational location, I suppose, in the middle, in the woods. And the school children came from both sides. But, uh, uh, you know, this caused also a lot of problems at least for me personally, because there were many tensions between, between uh, the two groups. And um, I tried at any uh, case to be loyal to me, my father, who was a school teacher, and uh, must um, at a very early date learn how to be neutral. And also it uh, led to the fact that in the daytime when the school children were there, I isolated myself quite a lot. I looked at their place more than took part in them. And my t time came in the evening and at weekends when I was alone with my closest friends, two or three friends I had. Mm -hmm. And you worked in the lab and <clears throat> worked around the schoolhouse and had a good time creating things even then. Yeah, and I must say it surprises me uh, almost uh, today how uh, much freedom my parents gave me. Uh, my mother tended to be a little nervous lady, but uh, she actually let me play around in the woods as I looked, and I had a, a little boat on the stream outside and so on. And my father gave me all freedom. He um, had a little school lab and a, a library and so on. And uh, when the school children were not there, I was left free to make experiments and do what I wanted which uh, I, I think was uh, extremely helpful uh, later. 
Your father, I think, appreciated, or you felt he appreciated your inventiveness. He also approved very much of your doing experiments in the lab. And yeah, the, he did. Um, I remember as a very, very small child how uh, my father, he's standing here with his class, I'm sitting just <laughs> here. Um, he, he went to a course in Göteborg. Uh, I think it must have been about 1921 or 22. Uh, it was before I started school, mm -hmm. uh, a course which was called um, the Home Area Studies. Uh -huh. They had a very inventive and active group of um, uh, educators in Göteborg. Two names are worth naming, um, Sjöholm and Goers. Goers was the artist and um, Sjöholm was the teacher. And they wanted to introduce in the Swedish schools uh, a kind of study which must have been about um, the same kind as Le Play had in France, or maybe the influences came from Germany, mm -hmm. I don't know. But he came home from this course uh, with great enthusiasm, you know, and started to do with my brother and me and his school children all sorts of things he had learned in that uh, course. And um, I think that this is actually the start of my geography. I, I never chose geography as a field. I sort of grew into it. Somehow. Yes, but you did this home area type mapping and, and describing your own local area. Oh, I, I remember vividly. Uh, uh, it, it's one of the only things I really remember from my first school years when we learned to make maps. Uh, you know, at that time, the school discipline was very strict, and you had, uh, when school started, you had to line up in a row outside and march into your place, and you must stand there until the schoolmaster said, please sit down, and so on. It was all half military or not. But that day, when we uh, were going to make a map, uh, first of the school uh, room, mm. we were left completely free. <laughs> Somebody was standing up at the blackboard uh, with a, a, a ruler and, and chalk, and the others were running around and measuring and shouting numbers back to the fellow at the blackboard, and it drew a map of the school room. I remember that so vividly because suddenly we were completely free, you know, and we created something. And everybody else could understand the relationship between this abstract picture and his real place in the room, the bench. We put the names of the kids on the map and so on. So that uh, was the way he approached um, uh, it, and a little late, perhaps a week later, and so on, we made a similar thing at the school uh, yard. And uh, as a third step, it came a, a map of the parish as a whole. But uh, this we couldn't do ourselves, of course, so my father prepared a, a map, uh, two meter long or so, and I helped him, of course, uh, since he made it home to do this, color it and so on, and then it was put up on it. In the school group. That's really important because I, I think that both your father's influence on you and the experience of putting together a map in a way of sort of handicraft artisan sort of way, uh, both of those things appeal to you. Yes? Putting that map together was a very significant experience for you. You made a portrait of your father one time, didn't you? Yes, yes, yes. I did. Oh, it was not, uh, he was not, no longer <coughs> alive, but I loved him very much and I sort of. Uh, try to get him back to life again by mm. trying to draw this portrait. It's made after a photography, of course. Mm. But intellectually speaking, your father had a very strong German sort of background, isn't that true? Kind of idealist German, noblesse oblige, and uh, liberal, political, and so on. Do you think his whole world view, in effect, got communicated to you? Yeah, yes, and he, um, he used to he, he was very fond of writing poetry. I don't think it was extremely outstanding, but he, he, he made verses, you know, for our Christmas gift and when we had a birthday, <coughs> a school examination and so on, and there was always a little moral uh, 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 climax in it. So, uh, for example, saying that you must make your duty in all weathers, and that sort of thing. So uh, I guess that had an, a profound influence on me, that's true. Uh -huh. So then you went to high school also in part of Småland, is that right? Uh, well, uh, the, the high school was situated, 
about 10 miles away and there was no other way than going by train every morning and every night. And um, uh, believe it or not, my father and, and a few of his friends um, managed to arrange uh, the train to stop at our village uh, so I could <laughs> get on it and back again to school. This wouldn't be possible in today's society at all. At that time we were perhaps two or three kids who uh, uh, used the train and they managed to make a little station. So. Uh -huh. That was very consistent. Yes. And then you came to Lund, yes, in 1930. Uh, well, uh, I left school in 1936, uh, and then I had a year of military service up in the Stockholm area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came to Lund uh, in autumn um, 1937. Uh, uh, it was a funny day, you know, because when I uh, went on the train, my parents uh, were followed me down. It was a long journey at that time, you know, and you were going to disappear for half a year. They weighed me uh, at me, and, and when I came into uh, the coupé, there was a, an old beard man who um, used to be a kind of um, missionary and who had visited my home many times. He, he, he was also an old school teacher, and he was on his way out to Denmark or Germany. So he, uh, we made uh, uh, he, uh, we had company all the time, and uh, when we came to learn to the station, he followed me out on the platform, you know, and uh, when I had taken leave of him, he raised his hand like that, you see, and, and, and blessed me. I, I remember this uh, so vividly. He had a white, long beard, you know, and everybody turned around and looked at this the funny couple standing there. But that was my, my uh, that's how I entered Lund. <laughs> Fantastic, <laughs> with a plum. And Lund has really been the seat of your major life experience since 1937. Yes, since then I <coughs> lived here. I had, I had my home here except for a short period. Yes. That's true. Well, that's a good 40 years of straight academic <laughs> commitment, and it's during those 40 years that you have done the things we've all heard about. Now, in the geography department at that time, could you describe a little how it was? Well, uh, my teacher at that time, Helge Nilsson, he um, uh, had, um, um, he, I guess he was a kind of Hartshornian uh, geographer who um, uh, laid stress on the regional uh, uh, perspective, the regional approach. But he, he was not very good at um, um, explaining this or uh, making it, um, what should I say? Um, yeah, he he um, he was so he worked himself so intuitively. I'm sure he had a, a, a tremendous uh, feeling for relationships and an understanding of how things hang together in a, in a, in a region. But he he could only demonstrate how he uh, himself reasoned and so on to his students. But he could never really. Uh, go further than that. So it was very hard. It took a very, very long time before you got a kind of grasp of what he intended. But then, in addition, he had um, uh, he, he had um, a strong historical sense. He, to him, geographic explanation was to follow the development of an area from as far back in time as you could up to now. And of course Sweden with its uh, outstanding um, archives of historical maps and its population registers and so on is, is, could be a laboratory for that <coughs> kind of research. And then um, uh, teaching, the, the interesting parts of the teaching was field work, for example. We mm. made mapping in the field and uh, went around to, to make all sorts of in, uh, observations, interviewing people and so on. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, at least to my mind, the most interesting part of it. But um, I must say, I, uh, when I came here, I uh, was not really determined uh, to, to become a geographer then. Well, let me put it that, that way. Um, I, I knew that I didn't want to become a teacher, a school teacher. I haven't got enough of that at all. Uh -huh. 
Oh. Yeah. So this had to be avoided at any price. Okay. But you had to have certain combination of fields. So in case it turned out to be impossible to make a university career, you could always turn to teaching. It was a sort of a reserve outlet. And I think that it might have been my mother who was uh, responsible for this attitude. Because as a young girl, he, she was closely uh, attached to a priest family up in Småland, player. And one of their uh, uh, boys had gone to learn and become, uh, at that time, an associate professor or something, and he was supposed later on to be, become a professor. And he was the model. So everything, we made something wrong in my home, or uh, she always said, it was, they'd never had to, to they uh, were never let, uh, allowed to do like that in the Barkerids, the Vicarage, and so on. This was the model place, you know. And it uh, sort of uh, became taken for granted that the only uh, respectable thing is to make an um, academic career. And believe it or not, this old man who was my model, Hilding Pleil, he's still I emeritus know. professor. You've met him here. He's still alive in, in, in uh, England. But uh, the, the, you see how these connections go. So you, you sort of placed your bets, as it were, in a variety of places. I all did. of them were alternatives to being just a teacher. Exactly. And so these areas included those areas that you were pursuing? Yeah, actually, my, my, um, what I had hoped to start study was ethnology. Because my father, uh, he, in, in his later years, he built up, together with friends, a little local museum. And um, this interested me very much. I, I went around and measured old buildings and, and picked up old things. And, and uh, so on, uh, and helped him to arrange this. And, and when this museum was opened, that was in 1938, he wrote a prologue in his ordinary kind of uh, poetry. Germanic. Yes, mm -hmm. and um, he says at uh, the end that uh, uh, this museum is um, testimony of the forefathers life and and heavy work and <coughs> he hopes that uh, uh, later um, generations should learn here get visible knowledge of times past that was extremely important for him the visibility of things and the the the, uh, the, the, the tangibility you know and it still is for me yes. it still and, is for you very yeah much. and uh, and i contributed to this by um, making this little um, uh, uh, sketch sketch or hmm? picture of a Good. of a country house in, in typical uh, little cottage in, in Småland. But uh, you see, when I came to learn then, um, what they dealt with in, um, in ethnology was folklore more than material culture, or the more tan tangible parts of culture. Uh, by the way, the professor here, his name was Wilhelm von Sydow. He was the father of Max von Sydow, the famous uh, Ingmar Bergman actor. But he was almost exclusively interested in um, tales, folk tales and poetry and so on, and I was not at all interested in that. So I uh, tried what I could find closest, art history and geography. And I spent one year with both fields simultaneously, and finally then, uh, more by accident, I suppose, I was um, uh, asked by uh, Sven Björnsson, who was then associate professor in physical geography, to uh, come with him to a field st a station up in the Summen area, in the Jutland area, to spend the summer there for my first term paper. And so I did. It was a, a, a magnificent uh, landscape. Uh, I got very much attracted to it. And um, when I came back, they asked me if I wanted to become a teaching assistant in the geography department, and then I was there. You see, and, and uh, I can also explain why this happened so easily. My father had died in 19... 
38, and my uh, mother could not uh, support me at all, so I had to borrow money. But along with this teaching assistantship, you uh, got a free accommodation in the geography department. Yes. You had, had almost a kind of feudal system at that time, so you, you got uh, in nature, so to speak, a room. And for that you had to do six hours a week uh, in library or assisting the professor and so on. And clearly I accepted that. It was a great uh, uh, subsidy for me. And that's how they hooked me up in geography. So that was in Solvigat on Tretton? That was in Solvigat yes. on And you Tretton. lived there yeah. and worked there? We lived there and worked there, yes. And who was the most important? Who were the most important teachers or influences during that period of your undergraduate years, which were, I understand, 37 to about 40, yes? Yeah, uh, in, in uh, these periods, it, it was no doubt uh, colleague based in, who. Um, had an approach to uh, geography which I could appreciate and also he had the same um, interest in mapping in what was visible and tangible and he, he made marvelous field excursions. I learned to know this area uh, by heart around here and so on. And he, he his, I think uh, what he uh, could uh, bring over most of all was um, the art of observation. Uh -huh. he, he was a morphologist, it doesn't per se interest me very much, but uh, to w go out to work with him was very helpful. You learned how to look at things and, 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 mm. and uh, draw and conclusions. And Helga Nelson was your supervisor, yes? He was yes. the chairman. And yeah. But there also was Edgar Kant in those years. Yeah, but he, he came later. He came as a refugee from Estonia in, uh, at the end of, the, of the 1944, I think it was. And it was later then. It, uh, so it, it was later. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> he uh, um, got some sort of stipend to stay at the department and make a geographical dictionary. I think it was a crazy idea, but he, he, he started to do that in any case. And he um, had the ambition to go back to the original s sources for every term he, uh, mm -hmm. he found. So he started, I, I think he was a very learning man already before, but after that he started to read almost everything which had been printed and it could vaguely be called geography, you know. So he became a living encyclopedia, whatever you, uh, question you had, he knew everything and he had a strong personal interest, so he, he knew also all sorts of things about the authors personally. Uh -huh. Letter writing was his main preoccupation. He had a marvellous handwriting. Oh yes. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So he taught you, though, a good deal, didn't he? Yeah, he did in a, in a uh, peculiar way, because I was um, asked to become his assistant to begin with. He could know Swedish, and he needed somebody who could translate his uh, things, you know. And also, I was asked to pick up Swedish terms for the German and English and French and what have you. He, he came up with. So we spent day after day, two hours a day, I think for a couple of years, in his smoky room, and most of the time we talked about all sorts of things except what we were supposed to do. I think. <laughs> so um, I learned a lot from him, and my uh, he opened the windows towards Europe. Of course, he had studied in in Paris, in Amsterdam, in uh, Hungary, and. Mm -hmm. And also to the world of demographic statistics and migration models and things like that. He had worked a little with that. Yes, and uh, no. Uh, I, uh, when I met him, I had already worked on population uh, uh, analysis, and, and uh, my work on migration was almost finished before I met him. I think what he uh, showed me was this possibility to summarize in uh, mathematical formulas and so on. But uh, <coughs> he, he more, the, what was really new was his social geography, which he talked about. He never published anything in Swedish and uh, <coughs> his the Estonian pub uh, publications are not accessible to us here. But he talked a lot about his um, studies of um, Tartu in Estland where he had actually mapped the activity spaces of various social classes. And he even show, uh, showed um, 
pictures of the homes of the various social classes. And this was so dramatically impossible for us here because being a geographer was to be out in the field and look at the landscape, but to include the inside of people's homes in, into the concept of the landscape was absolutely new. But uh, that, uh, I, I think, uh, actually prepared me for the kind of uh, of uh, uh, things you have <laughs> you have taught me because this was the first step mm. towards actually mm. taking the human being uh, seriously not just as an artifact in, in the landscape. Oh, I've been amazed at, at, at Kant's studies, what Grano showed us in Finland and so on. In 1920 already he was doing things like yeah, the Parkenbergers yeah. were doing yeah. in Chicago. Oh, he, he would have been a classic <laughs> if that had been uh, being translated at that time. Absolutely. So now then you went to field work. We can't get lost altogether on Solveig <laughs> uh, You went to Osby, back yeah. to the same area where you had done this summer camp. Yeah, yeah. And you did some work there which was of a general regional kind to satisfy the requirements of the licenciate. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, uh, one of the peculiar features of this um, department was that it, it was not really problem oriented. Perhaps it was a good thing. One had to find out oneself what to do. Mm -hmm. But nobody told <coughs> you anything. You just uh, were sent to an area. And, and told, study this area. And, uh, you know, uh, when you start from the beginning, you don't know where to, 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 what to do. So what I actually did to start with was to look at the relationship between settlement and um, uh, morphology. Mm -hmm. It was a natural thing at the time when you um, did see human and, and physical geography as a unit. But I, I couldn't get out uh, much of interest uh, of that. So instead I uh, said to myself, let me see if one can establish a closer understanding of how people actually use uh, the resources they have in, in the area, and how can one do that? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in this area, um, it uh, uh, Lonely uh, at uh, uh, hand to look at <coughs> what happened after the uh, immigration to United States. This area was uh, the one I think where immigration to America started. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, uh, thousands of people left, and there must have been significant um, uh, adjustments in the area afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to myself, if I could, could follow this population movement, perhaps I could establish a relationship between population movement and the livelihood possibilities they had in the world. And that's where the major idea behind the <coughs> migration diffusion model was born, in fact. <coughs> Even though you didn't articulate it as a model before 47. No, we, uh, Brit and I started on a, a sort of impossible empirical work, but we, we didn't understand when we started what it would uh, be. We, we simply decided to follow in the church registers, a kind of population archaeology, every individual mm -hmm. who had lived in that parish for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And we uh, spent two summers, day uh, after day, on this job. We went to the vicarage and got the old books and then through the village to the place where we lived and then we s s sat until late evening and back again to the vicarage. And, so and um, uh, by doing this, you know, you finally got acquainted with the whole population in a personal way so somehow. Mm -hmm. And, and this experience has um, colored my whole uh, world view. Mm -hmm. To follow people like this, how they were born, they moved around, they married, they got children, they died, they were sick and poor, and all sorts of things happened, and you could follow everything on it. And, and you can see population as a system, as a kind of vegetation, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you went out in the streets and met people you know, you could in your mind see back in time where, where they, th these particular people came from. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, from that moment uh, I came to 
Uh, oh, something struck me here, which I think I had uh, in me before, and this was the possibility or the necessity to to combine geography and time, not history, but time, in a different way than one had tried to do before. Instead of seeing time as a series of cross-sections, cross jumps between cross-sections, I would rather like to see processes ongoing like this, unbroken. And that's, um, in a sense, the only idea I have had in my life, and, and that's what I have been working on all the time. But you let it go to sleep, as it were. I did, yes. And went off on this diffusion model, which sold like hotcakes yes, in, in yes, the yes. Anglo world. Yes. But tell me about that, this diffusion model. Was that a sort of a short circuit on your, your great love, as it were? Uh, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> you see, uh, I, I had to make this first... Uh, licentiate degree, which uh, approximately corresponds to a PhD in 1947. And uh, for that I picked out on this uh, mass of data just the internal moves of this rural population inside Sweden. And I had the hypothesis to begin with that uh, people were very stable back in time and that as uh, technology developed and so on, mobility would increase and so on. But this was not at all the case. The mobility had not changed very much over the hundred years. People moved around quite as much at that time as they do now. It's only that distances were slightly short, but not very much, you know. Mm -hmm. And in these uh, migration fields there were also anomalies. So certain areas were preferred destinations and others avoided and so mm -hmm. on. And these patterns also were the same decade after decade. So then, uh, when I, uh, I had finished this study, it struck me that here must be something. Uh, um, the stability, uh, how, how did people get to know uh, about jobs at that time? Only by gossip. That must have been the only way of meetings at markets and so on. Mm -hmm. In other words, the migration pattern must depict very closely the social network okay. structure. But if that is so, I said to myself, then also ideas must move in this network. So let me see if, the, if it works. If I take what I know about migration and, and, let, me, uh, and, and let model wise an idea start somewhere, let's see if it, it moves outwards as, it, as if this communication system exists. And uh, as you know, it, it worked reasonably well. Mm -hmm. I could computerize this and, and, and show that it worked. But my main interest was really not diffusion, the process. I used that in order to show that there is a stable communication network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after I had made this study in 1953, I started to see if I could could um, get more direct access to the network, first of all on the Swedish and later on on the European le level. Mm -hmm. So I spent much time on, for example, um, uh, uh, accepting uh, um, lists from uh, festschrifts, mm -hmm. who, um, who know whom. Uh, that was what I was interested in. And for one month I um, had um, 40 European daily newspapers to see who, who speak about whom, all in an effort to try to see if I could figure out a kind of, of um, structure in the communication, uh, social communication network of, of Europe. So in a way you, you, had, you had graduated a long way from the schoolboy looking out of the schoolroom window, wondering about how the farm population interacted and how the industrial kids interacted. Now you were looking at Europe or Sweden in yes. terms of who interacted yes. with whom and what yes. shapes it. Yes. But this older timeline interest was still asleep when you, by the late 50s, when you started getting interested in regional science and more quantitative um, regional work. Yeah, for various reasons mm -hmm. uh, I came into the, the planning activities and uh, one of the problems we had at that time was the great discrepancies in access to services, school, healthcare and so on in Sweden. And it struck me that perhaps this um, uh, time use approach could be a way of looking into um, uh, 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 
uh, yeah, it could be a, a way of, of getting a firmer grasp on how access to things influence the lives and possibilities, opportunities of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, those old ideas from the 40s uh, came, back. Ca came back, but at the micro scale. Yes. But on the other hand, I, I didn't hesitate to apply a micro scale because of the teaching I had had from Ega Kant, who had uh, told me that a geographer can go all the way from the details and up to the globe. Right, right. But there was that period in the 50s when you were actually teaching and you became a professor and all this. You had to let your research interests take second place, as it were, to your administrative work. Yes, what from uh, 57 and up to, 57. well, for ten, 10 years ahead, I did very little research because the time was full with uh, well, you, you did some probes abroad during that period, like in 57 you were in Edinburgh, right? That's yeah, right. I, I was inv uh, invited to Edinburgh to, um, and uh, there I, I um, uh, lectured about my diffusion models, um, but I was out too early. There was very little interest in that. But on the other hand, I met uh, Arthur Geddes, the son of Patrick Geddes, and was introduced in his family. They treated me extremely kindly and took me around in, in Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, through him I learned uh, to know the Geddes family, mm -hmm. the Outlook Tower and, and mm -hmm. this whole uh, <coughs> urban planning ideology, mm -hmm. which uh, influenced me quite a lot, I think, in the, the, the work I later on made on urbanization. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But you see, you had actually come to Edinburgh and later to Seattle with wares that hadn't been seen before in the Anglo world, virtually. Uh, the quantification of spatial pattern. It was something that was there already in the logic of what we were doing, but it hadn't really been done. And I remember being told I should read the propagation of innovation waves, and I had a hard time understanding what this had to do with geography you yeah. know, in Seattle. So you went to Seattle in, in 59. Mm. Yes, mm. This was during your administration period, in fact. You were a professor. Yes, yes, I, I got uh, yes. a leave of absence for spending yes. time in Can you describe uh, that experience of being in America with these? models you had developed? Well, uh, I, uh, yeah, first of all, I was surprised to find a group of people there who were at all interested in, in, in this, because the uh, Seattle group, Bill Garrison and, and, uh, and Dick Morrill and John Nystrom and so on, they were so dissimilar to what I had expected. Having read Geographical Review and Annals and so on, I didn't expect to find that people who were so congenial. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, when I became closer acquainted with them, I saw also different. I was genuinely interested in, uh, in uh, subject matter, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Whereas they were much more interested in techniques, analytical techniques, and they were much more interested in developing statistical test methods and so on. And I was more interested in trying to build a kind of societal world picture. The diffusion study, migration study, and so in my mind all were aspects of a sort of total picture of how a society living in a region, mm -hmm. how it how it functioned, mm -hmm. whereas they were more interested in techniques. Mm -hmm. Well, if my image of the situation is correct, my, I, my impression is that there were two irreconcilable camps at that time, the ideographic and the nomothetic, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. people who thought that all geography should be about the unique and the comprehensive mm -hmm. and so on, or those who felt that geography should be law-seeking and methodolo mm -hmm. methodologically sophisticated. And there was very little communication between the two camps and I think what was attractive about your visit was that you were interested in the whole picture but you still had the hardware you know which would enable you to be almost nomothetic about mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. picture so it was your, your and they still told me uh, that many times when I was a student at Washington that your diagrams on the boards and the little sketches you did on serviettes and so on were things that gave them their dissertation ideas of and so on but you're at it you you felt that they were just interested in the hardware I, I, well, I, it's not fair to say that, yeah. but uh, they were at least the leading uh, person there seemed to be that. Mm. But uh, some of them, let's say, uh, like Dick Morrill and so, I think he, 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 he was quite close to me, and he came over to Sweden then and made a, made a study. Yes. 
Well, Dick was my teacher, so yeah. I probably got a good version of what you were all about. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But your, your impressions of America, supposed yeah, to... Yeah, after the period in Seattle, we, um, um, uh, Britt and I uh, made a, a six-week uh, tour through America, first by Greyhound bus, which is a way of getting to the backside of American cities, <laughs> I suppose. And then uh, in Louisville, uh, our friends uh, Arnold Anderson and Gene Bauman from Chicago came down and brought us around to Tennessee and, uh, and Kentucky and so on, and up to Washington, D.C. by car. So we could stop anywhere and take pictures and so on. I have a, a, a marvelous co picture collection, which I have not fully mounted yet. But um, I must say, uh, uh, I was uh, sort of, my, my um, attitude to America became then very much uh, schizophrenic in a sense. I have never found so kind and open people. I, in many respects, I feel at home, I, I feel free, I, I like to be there. At the same time, I cannot understand how these nice people can accept to have an environment and the social conditions as they had. You know, it struck me as so, so improbable, uh, uh, this, this contradiction, you know. And, and the, the cities, particularly the city centers, were so appalling, you cannot believe it. Mm -hmm. And the big technological um, marvels they had and were prouder, I couldn't understand it at all, and how they spread junk in the landscape and how they handled their poor and so on. So when I came back from America, I spent a year or two um, uh, moving around to uh, planning meetings and so on, talking about uh, our car traffic. Uh, we had very little of that in Sweden at that time, and I tried to tell them what I should do in order to avoid to get the city centers destroyed and so on and so forth. But nobody really listened to that. But anyway, I think I found uh, some sort of justification for the planning work um, I went into because I sort of said to myself, if we let uh, industry and technology go as it want, then we quickly get that kind of society. And I, and I suppose this was my father's idealism. I didn't like to see Sweden develop in that way. Uh -huh. uh -huh. So you went straight into that regional development project, didn't you? Uh, after you got back from the early 60s. Yes, the early 60s. Started. The first thing we, we did was to um, to try to reform the administrative system. Yeah. That was one of your major uh, The works. first, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And that was a cooperative exercise. And the idea was to have a more rational organization of communes. Yeah, rational, that, that's correct, one can say that, but the goal was to, uh, to, to find a way of leveling out differences between the wealthy and the more poor strata in the population, so that uh, wealth you had in, in urban areas should be transferred to the surrounding rural areas. This was the main idea behind yeah. it. Mm. And as you look back, oh, that regional phase really lasted from 1960 until... Till 70, 70, yeah, a whole five, decade. The yes. 76 or so, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. And would, did that project allow you an opportunity to bring back this older fascination with lifelines and so on, or was it quite distinct? In fact? No, uh, this uh, work... Um, uh, I, I tried to, to work on two lines. One was uh, fairly straightforward practical studies, easy to understand and so on. And then I set off some of the resources for more pure theoretical uh, work. And, and finally that side of, of the matter became the mo mo most important. And by 1971 the Social Science Research Council decided to give me a personal research uh, chair so I could... That's when you picked up your... Uh, yes, ideas. yeah. And, and at that time I had uh, uh, tried to write about it in a general way in, in a, uh, a little uh, working group headed by Alba Myrdal called To Choose a Future. Yes. And there I, I maintained that we must describe society in a way that we respect the indivisibility and integrity of the individual. We, we must have a sort of people understanding of society instead of a role understanding as mm -hmm. uh, political scientists mm -hmm. have. Yes, I remember when we first met, that was in 71, that was a point that really, in fact, you know, 
surprised me that you, of all people, would be interested in, in individuals and in the experience of individuals, because all that had been produced in print was that which could have been produced by a big sort of operation of aggregate research on uh -huh. regional problems and transport and so on. Yeah. yeah, but you see, I had this picture from the 40s, from my work, or Brits and my work on the population registers. I had only never been able to to um, uh, give it a conceptual structure, so I could take it out and show people how, my, uh, how I saw this. Mm -hmm. And then when I uh, met you, uh, you gradually uh, uh, um, came me to understand that it's absolutely okay to take a look at a, sing a single individual, even to look at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> which is especially, in, uh, especially <laughs> at yourself and the, this is absolutely a logical conclusion of what I tried to do in the 40s but given the way people understood geography or so how could you dare to, to try to do that at that mm. time mm. but now I find it fascinating of course to use my own way of describing the population through time on myself yes, I have actually I have actually made a diagram here of my own life story or a couple mm -hmm. of So um, here is um, Europe. I, I have indicated the most important places where I've uh, been doing serious work. And then these are the places through the 20th century. And I have marked where I have been trying to do something or where I have existed. And in the background are some world events, like the two world wars, I take For it. example, yes. yes. But also the, the um, uh, em uh, emergence of, of new technologies, for example, uh, uh, broadcasting, television, mm. air, uh, transportation, and what have you. And you have all those important book, books mm. in uh, influencing people's mm. uh, Mm. The scientific understanding and so on. It could all be brought in mm -hmm. into a picture like Yes, that. even looking at that, you can see how much the trip to America, which isn't shown here, but it was 59, yes? It was 59, it was this yes. year. Yeah. Uh, how that, in a way, was the opening onto a very intense uh, period of international activity. Yeah, I have uh, tried to... It's, it, it's maybe a little bit confusing to see this, uh, but, but I, I have actually tried to show where uh, in Europe and also in America I have been active. So mm. these are the spots in Europe where I have one or several times been lecturing or mm -hmm. had seminars or conferences and so on. Mm. And this is the time when it happened. Mm. And then I have tried to indicate what kind of interests I had. So mm -hmm. these places and this period is dominated by talk about diffusion. Mm. And then from uh, 1959, 69, when I ha had this address in Copenhagen, what about people and regional science, the whole scene is uh, dominated by this uh -huh. so-called time geography. It's m not my invention, this term. I, mm. I don't know who invented it, but it seems to be there now. Uh -huh. And uh, in the meantime, there is some work on migration and uh, on geocoding and some other things I've been involved in. Uh -huh. Do you think that time geography uh, effort gave you a chance to marry those two interests you have? One, the kind of methodological interest in using clever little ways of combining data and so on methodologically, and the other interest of planning society and taking care of leveling out differences and so on. Do you think it has succeeded in doing that? Yeah, in a sense, you know, um, I think it, <coughs> it makes me understand something which I also picked up in a paper by Vining, I think it was, that your s planning is essentially a question of distributing constraints. It's not the question of, uh, of the telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. But there are some things which uh, they shouldn't do. And, uh, and, uh, so it's police? Hmm? No, it not necessarily. This must be agreed upon. But there are things you... That's my, okay. my view. You might mm -hmm. see it otherwise, I suppose. But let's take this, this idea of, of a new administrative division. Um, the purpose was not to, to uh, force people to 
do any particular things inside this. It was only to define which population groups were to cooperate. And if you leave that to themselves, uh, we had uh, in the 50s a first try there, mm -hmm. and uh, you found then that nobody wanted to have to do with the poor areas. Mm -hmm. So you forced them into it? Yeah. Well, I think it's right. Uh -huh. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, that you, if you forget those in society who are weak, you should be forced not to forget. I think that. Uh -huh. No comment? That's <laughs> <laughs> up to you. So this is your definition of planning, and it has a great um, aesthetic appeal also, because you can discover a language which, in fact, enables you to see the orchestra playing, as it were. You've written the score, as it were, for how the orchestra is going to play. Yeah, I'm not interested in writing the score, perhaps, but I, I think it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a way of, of, of seeing things which I believe has an educative value, and people can argue about their conflicts in a more uh, 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 quiet way, perhaps, if mm -hmm. they can see uh, the, the relationships between the ways of seeing things a little better. And you really believe in your language, but it wasn't always lines and dots. You also were interested in musical notation, weren't you? Well, so, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was, actually. Uh, I. Um, uh, sometimes I dreamed of being a composer, and I have a notebook here where I mm -hmm. put down melodies. I ran around in the woods and listened to birds and tried to imitate what uh, their songs and so on. Made plans for great symphonies. So. But uh, this was not serious. Uh, but you see, there is uh, something here. Um, uh, about the same time as my father taught me how to make maps. Mm -hmm. My um, mother uh, taught me uh, how to make uh, notation of music. I learned to play it, and, and it was about the same time I found that you can depict things graphically, even if you cannot see them. Yes. Mm -hmm. So at the same time as I learned how to make maps of what I can see, I learned to make graphical pictures of something you cannot see but mm -hmm. just hear. Mm. And uh, and uh, so uh, this language representation has always fascinated me. And much. music was very attractive, and maybe that was part of the motivation behind the time modeling of society and activities and so on. Mm. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, whatever I had been uh, going into anthropology or history or language or whatever, I would have ended up uh, with uh, dealing with time. Mm. Um, Mm. But I think there are other questions that puzzle a lot of us, puzzle me still, and we've talked a lot. It's this question of what you mean by an individual, and uh, whether that individual is something that has to be administered or policed or organized institutionally or geographically, uh, objectively, let's say, or whether an individual is, in fact, some person that can be trusted to take responsibility and therefore should not be therefore so constrained. There seems to be those two, those two aspects of the individual. Um, I still don't understand how they fit together in your head. <laughs> no. Uh, See, on the one hand, you want freedom for the individual to play and be creative and write no, music no. if he wants or, or something no. else. But on the other hand, on the social planning and regionalization of Sweden, uh, you can believe that one can come to a definite uh, collective decision about what's right for everybody? No, um, uh, we have a political system in which people's uh, representatives uh, at least formally make the, uh, make the choice. And um, I, I guess all societies m must have some sort of ordering institutions. So uh, my, my conception of the whole thing is that freedom as much as, as uh, possible, but under certain constraints. And I think this goes back to a to large extent to my, my uh, American visit, where I saw the consequences of what I think is excessive in freedom. Mm -hmm. You think it's excessive, the kind of freedom Americans have? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the way they use it. But if they, uh, if they uh, could show a little more restraints individually, okay then. 
this uh, language maybe could, uh, could be used in teaching to show the consequences for others of what you, are, you yourself are doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, is, is something which makes me so nervous about modern technology. Okay, those engineers and administrators who invent it, they have great fun. But then they kill the fun for everybody else fairly soon, as, as, as soon as they have laid their system upon the house. What about the fun you kill when you decide where they are to live and move and so on? No, but there is nothing of that kind in, 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 oh. in this. It, 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 it's no question of deciding where people uh, have to move, but it is a question of them to know who they cooperate with when they mm. come to a new mm. place. Well, you have had an enormous range of interests and involvements institutionally and project-wise and everything else. What are some of the major lessons that you feel worth communicating? You've reflected a bit on all your activities and their sequence and so on. What would be the kind of advice you, you would be inclined to give, say, a young student in geography or somebody in my stage of life and so on? Are there lessons you've learned from this journey? <laughs> Yes, uh, the, uh, I think this lesson has to do with what we we, we talked about just now. I um, I would like to believe in the individual just as as, as you do, uh, and um, uh, the the only way I can see now in in avoiding uh, control is education. So perhaps one of geographers' main tasks today is not so much planning, because we have seen also that uh, even if you take a couple of steps in the, the best intention for reaching some goal, something else happens and everything goes uh, in some other direction. But if one could get uh, people um, in general to understand interrelationships a little better, perhaps one could uh, could help to establish this very delicate balance there must be between uh, freedom and uh, and and uh, constraint. But would you would you take that education not just to the people but to the administrators? As no, well? uh, no, absolutely not to the administrators. Why? Hmm? Why? No, they would uh, fast quickly use it uh, in 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 their interests. Yeah, well, I didn't mean have them administer education, but I meant to educate them on the kinds of things that geography can help people to understand. Okay, you know? I have no uh, no particular um, uh, uh, preferred group here, mm. uh, but um, I, I actually think for the, in the present situation in Sweden, it would be most important to get ordinary. Mm. To, to understand a little better how things hang together around mm. But from your own experience, you know, personally, what have been the most important lessons? What, what have been the things that have been most valuable to you? Have there been moments of fresh insight? Have there been, uh, you know, success in getting status and so on? What are the moments that stand out as being particularly significant for you? Well, uh, uh, these status questions, we can forget. Uh, I don't care much for that. The um, moments when I can sit together with somebody who responds and play around with ideas, that, that's, that's the, the, the high spots in life, uh -huh. really. Yeah. Even if they are absolutely useless, uh -huh. but, uh, but only to, to, to create ideas and see how they... Combine. That's uh, uh, th th that has been the, the most positive side of this uh, 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 being a, a university person. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as the universities have developed now, there is much less opportunity to it uh, than it used to be. Uh, why? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's there are so many barriers between students and teachers and. and uh, it, it, it's mm -hmm. much more uh, difficult than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one last question, because I know I'm making you tired. What do you think is Sweden's contribution, even if you take it within our own field of geography? When I was a student, it was clear. You know, we ramshackle little old regional geographers had to learn how to be systematic. You know, and Sweden was kind of the symbol of everything sophisticated in that realm. 
uh, 10 years, 15 have perhaps passed along. <laughs> uh, what do you think is Sweden's enduring contribution to the international community of geographers? As you might see it. Well, that is extremely hard for me to, to say, I must say. But um, a, a contribution we could give in the future is to invite people uh, to come here and, and take a look on both the positive and the negative sides of what has been achieved here. And uh, one of the, the most important things we we must develop methods for is to learn from each other. I came back from America in '59 and tried to tell people a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, technological development there. Nobody listened. We don't know exactly yet how mm -hmm. to uh, transfer experience from country to country. But if we could uh, find ways of doing that a little better then I think uh, we might have uh, achieved something. Well, I think you have done more in one lifetime to promote that than any of us can ever hope to do, in a very personal way, in a very helpful way. And there are many people all over the world who are grateful to you and don't have a medium through which to say it. So let's hope we can open up the doors to a more lively two-way communication in the future. Thank you very much for telling us all this. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming to Sweden and opened my eyes to many problems. I had not been able to see on my own. Thank you.